But um, I'm not doing that because I was preparing it all and thinking about it and all of a sudden God dropped something else in my heart and just went bang, bang, bang and I thought, whoa, where did that come from? It must be God, so I better preach it. So this is uh, not a fact that I'm forgetting about the church. I will be back on that, but this is just something I felt God speak to me and wanted me to share with you guys here this morning. So are you ready for the ride? Good. Okay, so... Um, a while back, um, one young lady used to come to church with trousers that had holes in them. And I would look at her and say, if you think that's what it means to be holy, I said, you don't know what holiness means. And we would have fun on it and that, and uh, I think she got convicted or got scared of me. Well, no, I think we'll add her more. And so she started to come without these holy jeans. And I would commend her on it. She's starting to understand. And uh, just recently, she's back to holy jeans, and she says to me, see, I'm holy. And I thought, good. I said to her, that's not what it means. Um, I won't tell you who the person is, but uh, you can look around at the trousers and you'll be able to figure it out. <laughs> uh, so we have fun, but yeah, it's, it's just banter. It's just enjoyable fun. We're, we're, but we're using the scriptures incorrectly, aren't we? Um, and that's one thing. There was another one, and I'm just building up to what I want to say, but it uh, used to be, um, in the past, uh, not, I don't think, but people used to come up to me and say, Pastor, I, I can't make it the next Sunday, but I'll be there in spirit. And I think, good grief, what do you mean by that? Do we have a spirit, a spirit chair for you to sit in, or uh, do I come to you the week after and ask you what the sermon was about, and you can tell me? Um, yeah, it's just uh, you know, just using super spiritual jargon to look holy. Nothing more. It's nothing. Yeah, it's in the scriptures, but you're using it incorrectly because it's about Paul saying when he sends a letter to the church that as they read it, I'll be there with you in spirit. And he's not talking about that somehow he's going to be teleported there and his spirit's going to be listening to it. No. It's what he's written that comes out there and it's like he's there in spirit through what he is teaching them in the Word. So that's what it means. But we take it and we use it incorrectly just to make it sound good that I can't be there but I'm there in spirit. Just tell the truth. You wanted to stay home and watch the rugby, that's all. <laughs> and so I want to talk today about another thing like this that where we take the scripture and don't uh, interpret it correctly or don't understand it correctly or use it to our advantage when it was never intended to be for that reason. Would you like to go on that journey? Okay. So that's my introduction. Now we get down to business. Romans 6, 12 to 14. It says, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness for God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are under law, not so you're not under law, you are under grace. Okay. We all know that, don't we? We are not under law, but we are under grace. And this is used in several contexts where we are made to understand that law and grace are different, and they are. But we use it sometimes for our own advantage. I'm going to ask you, what does it mean to be under grace? Just because we have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Saviour and come to Him in faith, and then we live our lives as we want them to be, are we under grace? Let me explain. See, grace is not God's, just God's unmerited favour, where you do something wrong, God's there to get you out of it. You know? And we like that, because it's the idea that Basically, I can get away with stuff and just have to come back to God and ask Him, you know, forgive me, and uh, I'm back uh, in good shape with God. 
The real meaning for grace is God's empowering presence that makes you to be everything God wants you to be and to do everything God wants you to do. In other words, to be the person God wants you to be, you have to operate in grace. And how do you get into grace? I'll tell you that later, so I'm not going to tell you. Um, now, I'm going to look at a story. It's in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the time of law, right? Not grace. Now, the prophet Elijah has just told the king, it's not going to rain till I say so. And then he goes away, disappears, and he's at a brook for a period of time where the <coughs> ravens are feeding him, and he's drinking from the brook. The brook dries up, and then God says to him, now go to uh, a widow, and he names the widow, and so he goes off to this widow, and he meets this lady. And she is there making her last pancake with the oil she's got so she can eat it with her son, and after that they have nothing less left, they are going to die. She has limited resources, right? And the man of God comes, and I use that term very loosely, uh, the man of God comes and says to her, make one for me first. Now put yourself in that situation. You have limited resources and someone comes or God comes to you and says, go and use that money for me. What are you going to say? Get lost. <laughs> That's a good answer. Get lost. What are we operating in? Is that grace? You see, what this woman did, she had this left and she was challenged to give first to Elijah. And she stepped out in faith. See, that is the issue of operating in grace. You never operate in grace unless you operate in faith. Faith is what brings you into grace. And so she steps out in grace and the resources that she had lasted to the end of the famine. How did that happen? Miracle, obviously. But the miracle happens because she stepped out in faith. And when she stepped out in faith, what happened? The enabling power of God, which is the grace of God, starts to operate in that situation and she is her needs are completely met. Got the picture? It is faith that brings us into grace. Now I'm talking the Old Testament, not the New. So if you think grace doesn't happen in the Old Testament, it only happens in the New, you've got it wrong. Grace operates right through the Bible, not just in the New Testament. Grace is what we are to walk in. But unfortunately, many of us choose not to. I want to talk today about the area of what is the issue with tithing because some people, now let me get this straight, for the visitors here, I really talk about money, yet it is the most uh, biggest subject in the Bible, but I don't do that that much. So this is one Sunday when you, you're here that I'm talking about it. Um, let me say this very clearly, you came on the wrong Sunday. <laughs> okay, but it's not a common thing I, I will talk about, but it needs to be talked, you see, because there are people who say that tithing is Old Testament. It's not New Testament. It's not found in the New Covenant, it's found in the Old Covenant. Therefore, as believers, we actually don't need to tithe. And the problem is, we give half the information, and therefore we come to the wrong conclusion. So let us have a look at the subject and see what the New Testament says it is all about. Would you like to do that? Okay. Just remember, when we understand, we become responsible. Okay. The first thing I want to say in this, ah, let's just talk about something else. So we say tithing is Old Testament, not new. So therefore we don't have to follow it. Well, let's look at something else. Honor your mother and father is in the Old Testament, isn't it? You know what Jesus says in the New? If anyone does not hate his mother and father, he is not worthy of me. 
So has God changed under the Old Testament, uh, honouring your father to now and mother and making it where you have to hate your mother and father? Do you believe that? Everyone says, I don't know now, I'm confused. You see, just because new and old is slightly different, it doesn't mean to say the old is done away with. So I want to say that. So let's just look. Firstly, is tithing mentioned in the New Testament? Can anyone tell me? Yes or no? Yes, where? Let me give it to you. Uh, Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise, aniseed, I think it is, and come in and have neglected the weightier matters of the Lord, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others under. What's he talking about here? Were they just the three plants he talked about are herbs? So were they tithing herbs and that's it? No, that's not what it's saying. He said they they were so diligent in their tithing that they were even going down to tithing what they grew as as herbs, not just the wheat and the barley harvest, not just the animals that they produced. Because remember, tithing in those days was not money. Tithing was what you produced on the land, and that was given. So he's saying, you are so diligent in tithing that you are actually even giving of that which is your herbs. It's like us today. Say you have some old clothes and you take it down to the op shop and you get some money from that. Do you put aside a tenth of what you got from that to be given to the offering? Most people say, oh, forget about it, it's such a small amount. Not really that important. But the Pharisees were so diligent in their tithing that they were going down to that level. And Jesus says, you hypocrites, you do that but you would neglect the more important things which are justice and faith. But then he tells us this, he said, you should do these things, but not neglect the other things. What's he saying? Don't stop the tithing, and, but add to that the justice and the faith and those issues. So here Jesus commends them on tithing. So if you're saying there's no mention in the New Testament about tithing, well, could you please explain to me how that verse is not about tithing? Jesus affirms what they are doing. You got it? So that's the first thing when you say it's not in the New Testament. It actually is. Okay, let's go and look um, at... The New Testament. There are three pictures in the New Testament of how the early church handled money and how they operated in grace when it comes to money. The first one is found uh, when we understand the story. It's found in John 12 verses 1 to 6. It's coming to the Passover and Jesus is at a, a, a feast. Passover feast. And a lady comes in with an alabaster box of oil. She breaks it on his head, anoints him. And uh, it says there that the disciples got a little upset because, what was it? Judas Iscariot says this money could have been, this could have been sold in the money used for the poor. And then it goes on and says this, that he was not really worried about the poor, but he was the one that held the treasury box. And uh, that money would have gone into that, and he was taking from that for his own purpose. So that gives you a bit about Judas Iscariot, but it also gives you an understanding of how they handled their money. Firstly, they had a common purse where the money went. And out of that was distributed the needs of the people, of, of their community, and also those in need outside the community. That was it's a, was it about. So does that mean then that we all should put our money together in one big purse and then come to that purse for when we have needs and get it distributed out and, and live like that? No, that's what you call cut and paste, where you take something in the Bible and you just say, that's what they did, that's what we must do. And uh, we take no regard for the different time and environment that we are in. 
But the principle is this. Money in the church or in the community of faith was for the needs of the community and for those in need outside the community. That's the first principle of New Testament giving. Do we understand? That goes on into the, into the book of uh, Acts. And uh, it's one that Peter has talked quite well here. And it's, uh, it's enlarged there in Acts chapter 4, 32 uh, to Acts chapter 5, verse 4. And we have this story there. The church is growing and people started to bring uh, money to the church. We've lost some lights. Has someone switched them off? Can you see okay? You can just check it, yeah. Um, so... They were bringing money and selling land and houses and bringing it to the disciples for the need of the church. Okay? So that's no wrong one. Try again. No, wrong. No. The last one. Ah, thank you. We got it. Let there be light. I think God said that somewhere, didn't he? So... The principle again is that the need of the community is met by those in the community giving. But let's look at the giving. They sold land and houses to give to the, to the apostles for the work of the church. Now, it's a little different than today. See, most people in the, uh, the day laborers and most of the disciples would come under that category. Day laborers worked for a daily wage. And most people in the first century were, were about two to three days away from starvation. So you did not make much money. So for someone to build uh, equity, to be able to buy land and to, to maintain that land and keep it, it is a very difficult thing to do. And so you have to invest over generations often to build something like a piece of land which then you can lease out and get income off or grow something on and you continue to actually help support yourself. So it's a very valuable thing and it, to give it up and to give that to God. Do you know what you're saying? You're saying, I am going to trust you for my future. I'm going to trust you that if I give to you, that you will undertake for me. Just like that widow who stepped out in faith by selling that land and giving, they are stepping out in faith to trust what God, that God will be there for them. You want to know what New Testament giving is? That is New Testament giving. Story goes on and tells us Barnabas sold land and gave it. In the next chapter, which should never be the chapter break, then we have Ananias and Sars. Um, what's her name? Sapphira. Yeah, Sapphira. The one with fire. Sapphira. They did the same thing. And they sold land. They kept some of it back. And they gave the money that they wanted to give and said, this is from the sale of the land. Uh, and uh, yep, it's all, all what we got from the land. And the apostle said, you know, you're welcome to keep it for yourself. You are welcome to take part and not. But what you've done is you have lied. Not only to man, but to the Holy Spirit, to God. And because of that, they died. My question is, why would they lie? Why would you lie in that situation and try, why not just say, uh, we're giving half of it and the rest we're going to keep ourselves? Why did they do that? What was the reason? And the reason can only be this, is that they wanted to be seen as ones who were operating in grace. When in reality, they didn't really want to. Because to operate in great grace was to give so that you became dependent on God. That is the principle of grace. 
Now let's come to the next one. Because this is the, the three stories. Uh, where is it? Corinthians. Corinthians 8, 1 to 7. If you read these verses, three times he talks about grace, grace, grace. He says, moreover, brethren, he's talking to the Corinthian church and encouraging them to give. And in doing this, he's given the example or the illustration of another church that gave. And he's saying, this is the sort of giving that we should be doing. It is Paul's illustration of what it is to live in grace. You are not under law, you are under grace. Got it? And so he says here about this church, Moreover, brethren, we know, we, make, uh, we made known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, employing us uh, with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministry of ministering to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence and in all love for us, so that you abound in this grace also. The grace of giving. You are not under law, but you are supposed to be under grace. Okay? And here's the church that gave beyond its ability and gave liberally because of the grace that was on them. You got the picture? We say, oh, we're not under law, we don't have to tithe. Fine. What are you under? Because if you are under grace, you give to the extent where it makes you dependent on God. That's what it's all about in the New Testament. Um, we got it? Okay. That was the church. I want to... I've got plenty of time. I want to give a story... True story. And I think many people in this church could have given a story just as similar as this one. Especially if they have walked with God for any period of time. See, many of us struggle in the area of finance because we look at, you know, wow, well, it's, I, I've got to get a deposit for a house. And so, when I get that, I'll tithe. It's not my time to tithe yet. Once I get that, I will tithe. And they get it. And then, whoa, the repayments are so much. Well, I have to wait till you know, I can manage my repayments a bit more. Then I'll tithe. And down the track, they say, well, I need to go on a holiday overseas. You know? Everyone, young people today, are going on a, a world tour. So I need to do that. So I need to get that out of the way before I start to tithe. And then you're on holiday and then come back and all of a sudden the children, we want to send them to a Christian school because we want them to have good Christian values. Mm. So I need the money for that. You got it? And then at the end you say, whoa, I haven't got that much up for you know, my retirement. I need to put money for that. And the simple thing is, there will never be a time when it is convenient, whether it's not so pressured to actually start tithing. Because the whole point of giving 
is that it is to create dependency on God, not working out of our own strength. That's the data we have in Scripture. The three illustrations I've given you all have the same value in it. And that's all that the Holy Spirit has given us. And that data is there so that we understand what it is to give under grace. As I said, many people will have a similar testimony as my own one. Or if my wife was here, I'd have to say our own one. Um, very young age, I was challenged on tithing, so we started to do it. Uh, didn't have much. In those days, salaries weren't so big as they are now today. But we started to tithe. Um, in every situation, I have never seen God fail us. When we came back from Malaysia, we were there for a year in the church, we came back with $50 in our pocket. No jobs. And we had to start afresh. And in all that time, even though I didn't have a permanent job for many years, I never saw, we never saw God fail us financially. And we weren't just living from hand to mouth. We were able to build a house in New Zealand. We sold that house when we came here. And the year before we came here, we looked and we saw the prices of houses were very good in New Zealand. The prices of houses in Australia was very low. And I thought, fantastic. This is really good. We can sell our house. And we can go to Australia, we can buy a house without any mortgage. Fantastic, you know. Um, you know, just can do us. So we go back home, we pack up, took us a year to get here, and we came here. That was the year of change in both Australia and New Zealand. In New Zealand, the house price went down. In Australia, the house price went up. So we sold a house after we left New Zealand, it was so hard to sell, got here, and uh, when we got our money from New Zealand, exchange rate wasn't that good either. We didn't even have enough to buy land to build a house. We were back to square one. We got the house. We built it. And uh, started to pay the mortgage. You know what interest rates were in those days? 18% over. What is it today? Around four, under four. And if you're really good, even lower than that. A huge difference, wasn't it? And people said, it's so expensive to get a house. It's not much different to my day. We had a lot less money. The houses were a lot cheaper. But it took all that money, just like it does today. So it's not, and the interest rate sucked it out. Which we don't have today. At this moment now, Ed. Um, but in all that, as we honoured God, we did not once see ourselves blank. Because we built dependency on God. That's what it is about. You want to operate in grace? Then do that. You see, if we use and say, oh, we're not under law, but under grace... And it means on Sunday you're in church and the offering comes around, oh, I've got five dollars to chuck that in. That's okay. I'm under grace. No, you're not. That's not grace. That's anything but grace. So never, ever say we are under grace as an excuse to get out of doing what God has called us to do. And all our times, we gave more than what the law required us to give. And I look today and I say, there's a blessing of God on those who do that. We are not in the position today because we amassed our wealth and did it all ourselves. You know, I, there's one song that is the most ungodly song I have ever heard. you know what it is? Thanks, Frank Sinatra's I did it my way. 
That is the most ungodly thing to think, that we actually can do things without God. But if we use the excuse that tithing is not today to do less than what the law required, then we are doing it our way, not God's way. Let's come and have a look at another scripture. He says in Mark 7, 9 to 13, Jesus is saying, He said to them, this is to the Pharisees, all too well you reject the commandments of God that you may keep your traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother and he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father and mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is korban, that is a gift to God. Then you no longer uh, let, uh, uh, let him do anything for his father and mother, making the word of God of no effect through the traditions which you have handed down. Interesting scripture, isn't it? You know, Corban is a biblical truth. So what's the problem? You see, what is a tradition of man here? It is that the Pharisees had taken something which was biblical and distorted it to their advantage. You see, the tithe... In the Old Testament is called Korban, which means dedicated for destruction or dedicated to God. It was not profit. It was tithe. But here they switched something slightly and said that the profit is dedicated to God. Therefore, I am unable to help you, mum and dad, because I don't have anything to help you with, because all my money is dedicated to God. So they create a tradition which actually comes partly from the Word of God but is distorted. And they use that to their own advantage. We need to be careful when we look at this whole subject of what is under law and under grace in the area of tithing that we are not making a tradition of man for our own advantage, to neglect the Word of God. We understand? I want to say, if you ever teach the subject of tithing and say it's Old Testament, do not stop there and leave it. Teach what the New Testament says about finance and giving. Because it is far higher than the Old Testament. The principle that the Jews understood was that the lesser and greater principle, that which is lesser and that which is greater, and if it's true lesser, it is more true greater. So if the law is lesser than grace, then what happens in grace must be greater than that which happens in law. That's the principle. And so grace actually requires us to do more because it's not saying just live on the 90%. The 90%. It's saying you need to give so that it creates dependency. That's the principle of under grace. Amen? Let me see if I have anything more to say. just want to say this. To live by grace is through faith. If there is no faith, then how can we say we are living by grace? See, in the first century world, very simple. I know whether you're living in grace by what you do. That's how it was. You can't say you're living in grace and not do it. So, that is actually still true today. 
I know if you're living in grace by what you do. If you withhold, we're doing it in our own strength. We cannot say we are living in grace. We are living in our own strength. It has nothing to do with God, but all to do with traditions we are establishing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you've called us to be people who are not under law, but under grace. Lord, we don't want to stay under law, but we do want to operate by grace. And Lord, that requires us to step out in faith and to trust you with our life, with our resources. Lord, to believe you to undertake in every situation. Father, cause us to heed your word, not just listen to your word. Cause us to put it into practice that we may be the people that you require us to be. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we stand as we close in a song?